Welcome to the May 2017 Carver College of Medicine Bachelor of Science Commencement Ceremony. I'm David Asprey, Dean of, Assistant Dean of Student Affairs and Curriculum and Chair and Executive Officer of the Department of Physician Assistant Studies and Services. I would first like to extend a warm welcome to the graduates and their families. Tonight, we are celebrating the accomplishments of the students completing their Bachelor of Science degree in Medical Laboratory Sciences nuclear medicine technology, and radiation sciences. Please know that each of us on the stage tonight joins your families and friends in sharing in the excitement and the sense of pride as we acknowledge and celebrate your accomplishments with you. I would first like to introduce the members of the administrative team on the platform beside me and assisting with the ceremony. First, Dr. Michael Graham, Professor of Radiology and Medical Director of Nuclear Medicine Technology Education. This is a celebration. We encourage applause, so please do. Next is Dr. Anthony Knight, Administrative Program Director of Radiation Sciences. Stephanie Ellingson, Director of Diagnostic Medical Sonography Education. Jared Stiles, Director of Radiation Therapy Education. Jean Weiss, Director of Radiation Technology Education. Norma Ward, Administrative Specialist in Pathology. Jenny Myers, Director of Radiation Science Student Affairs. And representing the university's central administration, Dr. Jean Robillard, Vice President for Medical Affairs and Dean of the Carver College of Medicine. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Robillard will be conferring the degrees on behalf of the university this evening. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge other faculty members in attendance this evening. Would you please stand and be recognized if you're a faculty member involved with these programs? And I also think it would be only fitting to acknowledge those in attendance this evening that are family members of one of the graduates. So if you're a parent, a spouse, a partner, a sibling, would you please stand up as well? Thank you. We know that you have played a profoundly important role in helping these graduates achieve these important milestones. And may all of your future tuition bills be lost in the mail. <laughs> Finally, I also wish to recognize the Hands Up Communication for providing us with the sign language interpretation this evening. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Colin Durdane, Professor of Radiology, Professor of Neurology, and Chair and Education Officer for the Department of Radiology. Please welcome Dr. Durdane. Thank you, Dean Asprey. So uh, congratulations, class of 2017. This is, uh, so uh, the good news is that this is only going to be five minutes. And the bad news is that this is the first time I've done anything like this except for my own kids and, and their graduation, you know, that my address to them. So um, first of all, I'm very honored to be able to say a few words to you and to your parents, your families, your friends on this very special occasion. We're all incredibly proud of you, proud of the hard work that you've done, proud of the decision that you made to pursue this training and proud of the field that you're going into. Um, the, the, the importance of what you're going to be doing is only going to increase over, over time. The power of imaging, the power of, of laboratory sciences, of genetic and metabolic information to understand what's going on inside the body, to guide treatment, to diagnose diseases, to monitor responses, it's only going to continue to become 
more important, more relevant, and, 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 and to grow. Technology doesn't move backwards. I'm very excited for you, and I'm very excited for the role that you're going to be playing in the future. I want to talk to you briefly about some things that I think will change over the course of your careers, and then the things that won't change. In terms of, of what you'll be doing in 10 years, uh, technology will be different. There'll be different instruments, there'll be different computer systems, there's gonna be different information, there's gonna be a lot of things that, things that have changed. And I think there's gonna be a lot of changes in how healthcare works and how, how uh, we work together to do what's most effective and to do what's right for patients. And I think we're gonna see a lot of, of teamwork as well. So in terms of, of technology first, New, new technology. We're going to see optical imaging. There's some lab a medicine applications of that as well. Image guided therapy, photon counting, CT scanners, endovascular techniques for brain aneurysm, heart disease, uh, nuclear medicine, PET techniques for taking radionuclides directly to tumors. The, but the other big area, I think, too, that's going to happen with imaging is going to be more quantitative and imaging data processing. We're not just looking for gallstones anymore, although we still look for those. But more and more, these studies that we get are really for processing. We're, we're looking to take this data set that we get from a CT scan or an ultrasound or an MR scan, and then really uh, uh, run it through the computers to figure out, are tumor, tumor volumes bigger? Is the MS plaque in somebody with multiple sclerosis? Is, is there more volume now than there was before? Is it responding to treatment? four-dimensional movies of heart function. Um, instead of 3D printing, which we're doing now to model and surgical plan, there's gonna be virtual reality. The, the impact of computers and the impact of technology on what we do in imaging is really going to explode and you're all gonna be a big, a big part of that. Uh, the, the, the next part of this talk is really about seizing the opportunity when these changes do come down the pipe. If you see the chance to pursue something new that excites you, you should do it. Our program has a scholarship, and in fact, I think at some point here, you're gonna be hearing from Hannah Fink, who holds one of our, our scholarships, the, uh, the Scott Heary Fellowship Scholarship. He was one of our CT techs that passed a couple years ago. He, Scott was on the, the cutting edge of new CT technologies, new CT applications. And for some of you in the audience, you may think that a CAT scan is like your iPhone app and you hit the camera button and it takes a picture. It's a lot more complicated than that. The, these machines, you can change how they, how they take the picture, you can change the speed, you can change the angle. The, the, the menu of options is enormous. And the way that we take pictures, for example, of some blood vessels to the brain with the same scanner and the same body part, radically different than the way that we take pictures of, of the brain itself or measurements of blood flow to the brain, for example. And these are all different techniques, different processing streams. More and more things like this are gonna come down the pipe. Scott was really unique because he really embraced these things when they came along. And he was the first person to figure out how to make the scanner work and how to make us be better for, for taking care of our patients and for providing refer referring physicians what they need. Um, the second big area of change is, is teamwork. Our mandate as healthcare providers is to provide our patients with the best care and to do it as efficiently as possible. And the best way to do this, and what we're seeing more and more in healthcare, is through multidisciplinary uh, teamwork, where we have pretty much everybody's hands that touch this patient or touch the patient's scans, work together to figure out how do we provide the best value for this patient? How do we make this patient's experience the best the best possible, and you all are really going to be at the very front line of a lot of that. And, and your experience and your, your knowledge are gonna be critical in how we define how we deliver healthcare in the, in, in the years to come. So what doesn't change? What doesn't change is probably the most important things, the really critical human factors of what you do. Your commitment to doing a job well, to treating people with respect, your ability to relate to patients and see them as people facing off in terrifying situations, like do I have cancer or is my cancer getting, getting better? For many of you, you'll be the face of medical care to our patients, uh, the person that they spend the most time with during their encounter with us. And in our increasingly technical world, these human interactions are gonna become more and more critical and important. So to sum up, remember that what you'll be doing in 10 years will likely be very different than what you're doing now. You need to be open to that. 
Learn the new technologies that come along. Embrace opportunities for professional development and leadership because you're going to have them. Keep your eyes on the horizon and don't forget the importance of the human touch. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dardane, for those stimulating and encouraging thoughts. Our next speaker is Dr. Matthew Krasowski. Dr. Krasowski is the Vice Chair for Clinical Pathology and Laboratory Services in the Department of Pathology. Please welcome Dr. Krasowski. All right, first of all, congratulations to all the graduates. Um, it is my pleasure to speak on behalf of the students graduating with a Bachelor uh, of Science in Medical Laboratory Sciences, uh, MLS. So I'm a clinical pathologist who has worked in clinical laboratories my whole career. My own area of specialty is clinical chemistry and toxicology. I'll have a broader role as director of clinical laboratories at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. I regularly interact with MLS laboratory staff and management. The MLS staff are the heart of the clinical laboratory. Uh, it is estimated that 70% of all medical decisions uh, utilize information from laboratory testing. To many patients, their only direct contact with laboratory testing may be when a phlebotomist collects a blood specimen. In a sense, clinical pathology shares some similarities with other uh, healthcare areas such as radiology or pharmacy that have some direct patient contact, but also provide extensive behind the scenes operations. Not surprisingly, patients often don't give a lot of thought to the clinical laboratory or what happens to that blood specimen and how it eventually translates to laboratory results. Nevertheless, those results end up being critically important to patient care. There are many examples where laboratory results immediately impact clinical decision making. One of the clearest examples is troponin, a laboratory test that is crucial to the diagnosis of myocardial infarction, also known as heart attack. In a patient presenting to the emergency department with chest pain, the troponin value can dictate whether that patient goes to a procedure such as angiogram or to consider other diagnoses for chest pain. There are also diseases where nearly every part of the clinical laboratory plays some role in the diagnosis, treatment, and uh, follow-up. A good example is multiple myeloma, a disease of the bone marrow that can lead to a variety of complications, such as bone fractures uh, and repeated infections. The initial diagnosis of multimyeloma is usually made through a combination of immunology and hematology testing, uh, including bone marrow biopsy and examination. Once the diagnosis is made, highly specialized flow cytometry and cytogenetics testing helps with prognosis and specific treatment decisions. Some patients with multimyeloma are now being treated with stem cell therapy, which utilizes hematology and the blood bank. Patients with multimyeloma are also at risk for infections, so the microbiology testing plays a valuable role. And then throughout the treatment and follow-up process, many of the same clinical laboratory services are utilized. Thus, even though mostly invisible to the patient, the clinical laboratory is there throughout the entire cycle of patient diagnosis, evaluation of treatment, and prognosis. And there are many other diseases where this is the case. One of my favorite things is to have people visit our clinical laboratories at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics. This may be healthcare students, hospital administrators, or even sometimes patients who are interested in seeing, for example, what actually happens to their bone marrow after they get that biopsy. The most common response from those on these tours is something along the lines of, wow, I had no idea this was all there behind the scenes. So in larger specialized clinical laboratories, such as at the university, MLS staff often specialize in specific areas such as hematology or microbiology. These larger labs tend to do high volumes of testing on a combination of large automated instruments and then often some smaller specialized instruments. But in a small or medium-sized community hospital, the clinical laboratory is much more compact and sometimes only one or two MLS staff are basically running the operation. In that type of setting, the most impressive part is that MLS staff are simultaneously handling diverse areas that would otherwise be separate in a much larger hospital. Regardless of laboratory size, MLS need to have a unique technical skill set to work with and interpret complex laboratory testing. We are currently at a time of rapid technological change. This is exciting, but can also be daunting in trying to keep up with that change. 
I started medical school in 1994 and can think of a long list of laboratory tests that I learned back then that are now obsolete. The biggest changes right now are in genetics and also specialized technology such as mass spectrometry. These are steadily allowing for improvements in disease diagnosis and management. Today we have the privilege of recognizing two talented students graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Medical Laboratory Sciences. You're entering the field at an exciting time and I congratulate you on your accomplishments and welcome you to the field of clinical pathology. Thank you, Dr. Krasowski. Our next speaker, Hannah Fink, is a member of this year's graduating class and was chosen by the Radiation Sciences Student Organization. Hannah is a founding member of the organization from Olawine, Iowa, and is graduating with the highest distinction with a Bachelor of Science degree in Radiation Sciences and a minor in Human Relations. Hannah will continue her education in the University of Iowa's Healthcare Administration Master's Degree Program. Please join me in welcoming Hannah Fink. Thank you, Dean Asbury. Good evening. I would normally begin a speech with, hello, my name is Hannah Fink, and I'm a senior in the Radiation Sciences Program at the University of Iowa. It's rather frightening that tonight is the last time I can use that specific introduction. As many people say, all good things have to come to an end. Whether it took four, five, or another number of years, we don't want to admit, this, the college experience has been one of those good things. Everlasting friendships, strong professional relationships, and countless memories that will never be forgotten are only a brief description of our time spent here. As a more confined cohort in the, Car in the Carver College of Medicine, I consider myself and all of my classmates lucky to have received such a high quality education. Teachers and staff at the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics have not only been genuinely interested in educating us, but they always showed interest in our well-being and encouraged us to persevere even when classes or just life got challenging. The experiences we have had at this institution make it difficult to imagine ourselves anywhere else. However, in knowing the values and skills instilled in us during the past few years, we are confident that we can succeed in an array of environments and contribute our own Iowa touch to any position. On behalf of the students graduating today, I would like to thank our instructors, program directors, advisors, mentors, and family members for helping us with the achievements we'll forever be grateful for. I found a quote describing college, career paths, and life in general quite well. It states there's no straight path from your seat today to where you're going. Don't try to draw that line. You won't just get it wrong. You'll miss big opportunities. Don't stress out about the white space, the path you can't draw, because therein lies the surprises and opportunities. To my fellow Hawkeyes, I wish you all the best of luck on your certification exams. Hope your future endeavors are, are as successful as this exact moment and encourage you to be patient and enjoy those white spaces filled with the opportunities leading you toward your next greatest accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Our final speaker this evening, chosen by the Radiation Sciences Student Organization, is Lori Gillitzer. Lori is a Radiation Sciences Educator and the Clinical Coordinator of the Radio Radiologic Technology Program. Please welcome Lori Gillitzer. Thank you, Dean Asbury. Good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to thank the graduating class of 2017 for inviting me to be a part of your special celebration tonight. It is really an honor and a privilege to be standing before all of you intelligent and beautiful people. Um, I'd also like to extend a warm, warm welcome to all family, friends, um, and faculty here tonight. So I was thinking about what I should talk about tonight, and the word choices kept coming to mind. And then my thoughts went to my favorite books because I love to read. And this brought me to my personal favorite book, which is Harold and the Purple Crayon. It was written by Crockett Johnson in 1955. And while it is a children's book, I like the, uh, the symbolism in the book about journeys and journeys in life. 
The main character of the book is Harold. He's a, cur a curious four-year-old boy, and he has a magic purple crayon, which allows him the ability to create the world of his very own by simply drawing. His story takes the readers on journeys where whatever he draws comes to life. Harold's story begins with him taking a walk to explore, and he doesn't seem to be getting to where he wants to, so he decides to draw a shortcut. So he chooses to draw this shortcut, and this shortcut takes him to a place where he thinks maybe he should draw an apple tree forest. So he chooses to draw this forest, but then is worried that someone might come and take all the apples from the apple forest. So he chose to draw a dragon to guard all of the trees. The dragon was very scary to Harold, and as his hand shook, the crayon he was holding drew wavy lines and created an ocean that he found himself completely submerged in. But he came up thinking fast, and he chose to draw a boat to sail in. After a bit, he decided that he would like to land, so he chose to draw some land, and after he arrived, he wondered where he was. So he chose to draw a hill in order to see where he was, but instead of a hill, it kind of turned into a mountain, and as he climbed to the very top of that mountain, he found himself falling off the other side. But Harold thought quickly and chose to draw a hot air balloon, which he found himself drifting off in. He decided it was time to go home, so he chose to draw the window of his bedroom, where he finally climbs into bed. Harold made choices all throughout his adventure, and he used his purple crayon to draw his way out of each of his dilemmas. I believe you all are a little like Harold. You all started out on this adventure just like him, with lots of uncertainty. Think back to your very first day of class. You may have been handed a binder full of everything you were supposed to know over the next few years, and you may have thought to yourself, what have I gotten myself into? Quickly, your classes began, and you couldn't believe how much there was to learn in order to go to clinic and perform exams. And then there was the equipment to figure out and perhaps positions to master. There was just so much to learn, and it was all happening at once, and you wondered how you would ever be able to figure it all out, but you managed to find your way. And just like Harold, you forged ahead, sometimes choosing to stray from the long, straight path, sometimes choosing a very different path. Many more times, you would visit the clinical areas, each time gaining more experience and able to complete more and more on your own. Can you remember how hard it felt to complete your very first exam or maybe run your own test? And now you could do them in your sleep. You had your purple crayon and you drew your own way. Maybe you chose to listen to a patient who needed to be heard, or maybe you chose to stop and give someone directions because you finally knew where you were going. Or maybe your choice to take the extra time to get the best images for your patient was the right thing to do. Sometimes, like Harold and the Dragon, when you fell into a situation where you were in over your head, you quickly thought of a solution and made your way through. Looking for the answer to a problem in class or clinic, you, like Harold, may have found yourself climbing to the top of that hill and sometimes making it into a mountain. But as you were free falling off the other side, Unsure of how things might turn out, you made a choice to grab onto that balloon and you sailed on through. That purple crayon gave you the promise that anything is possible. It isn't always easy, but it is good to remember that you get to choose what you do and where you go. I want to leave you with a final thought to ponder. When you're 80 years old and you're sitting in a quiet moment of reflection, narrating only to yourself, the most personal version of your life story, the things that will be the most meaningful will be the series of choices that you have made. Because in the end, we are all our choices. So be like Harold, grab your purple crayon, and go out there and write yourself an amazing story. Wow, thank you, Lori. I now wish I hadn't eaten that purple crayon when I was in kindergarten. <laughs> I would now like to introduce Dr. Anthony Knight. Dr. Knight is the Administrative Director of Radiation Sciences Education and the Director of the Nuclear Medicine Technology Education. Please welcome Dr. Knight. Thank you, Dean Esprit. 
We are pleased to have with us, for the conferring of degrees, Vice President for Medical Affairs and Dean of the Carver College of Medicine, Dr. Jean Robillard. Please join me in welcoming Vice President Robillard. Will the candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Medical Laboratory Science, Nuclear Medicine Technology, and Radiation Sciences please rise? <clears throat> Vice President Robillard, these candidates, having completed all the requirements for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Medical Laboratory Science, Bachelor of Sciences in Nuclear Medicine Technology, Bachelor of Science in Radiation Sciences are recommended to you by the faculty of the Carver College of Medicine for the conferring of these degrees. And on the recommendation of the faculty of the Carver College of Medicine and by the authority invested in me by the State Board of Region, I confer on each of you the degree of Bachelor of Science in Medical Laboratory Science, Nuclear Medicine Technology, and Radiation Sciences as qualified and designated. Thank you, Dr. Robillard. The turning of the tassel is the traditional gesture by which each student signifies passage from degree candidate to graduate. Now, before we recognize you each individually, please mark your new status as graduates of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine by moving your tassel on your cap from right side to left. <laughs> Will the graduates please be seated? We would now like to recognize each graduate individually. The Bachelor in Science for Medical Laboratory Sciences graduates are V. Ho. Knock Fam. <laughs> the Bachelor of Science in Nuclear Medicine Technology graduates are Zahara Al Mahdi. Madison Boardman. <laughs> Michaela Butler. <laughs> Christopher Kripel. Micah Lassen. Oh, 
Victoria Nelson. Justin Strumpfer. The graduates for the Bachelor of Science in Radiation Sciences Diagnostic Medical Sonography program are Alyssa Bosco. Ashley Bosco. <laughs> Summer Al Hussein. <laughs> Mackenzie Feld. Rebecca Hott. <laughs> Emily Kalb. <laughs> Kinley Molin. <laughs> Lucas Rock. Mackenzie Shetty. Jill White. The graduates of the Bachelor of Science degree in Radiation Sciences Radiation Therapy program are Jordan Anderson. Stacy Flam. <laughs> Alex Flora. <laughs> Jamie Kepler. <laughs> Jessica Colzo. Lauren Shoup. Auburn Templeton. The graduates of the Bachelor of Science in Radiation Sciences Radiologic Technology Program are Mariah Bauer. Aaron Bransgard. <laughs> Hannah Fink. <laughs> Kyler Friedhoff. Ivan Galvan. <laughs> Kayla Hogeman. <laughs> Abigail Keith. Jennifer Martin. <laughs> Alexandria Musik. <laughs> Ariel Oriana.
Sabrina Santucci. <laughs> Emily Wolf. The graduates in the, of the Bachelor of Science in Radiation Sciences RT to BS online track are Courtney Anderson, <laughs> Shannon Murray, <laughs> Jessica Marie Smith. Congratulations to all the graduates. Let's give them a round of applause. Well, this has been a beautiful ceremony, aptly recognizing the accomplishments of the graduates this evening. And I am now acutely aware that my comments are all that remain before you can officially begin celebrating this great accomplishment with your families. And I was once provided some very sage advice from a colleague who let me know that speaking at a commencement is like being the corpse at a funeral. It's critical that you be there, but no one really wants to hear you say anything. <laughs> so, with that admonition, I will close by simply saying, colleagues, friends, and family, allow me the distinct pleasure of officially presenting to you the graduates of the class of 2017. They, please. They are among the brightest, most talented, and compassionate healthcare providers in the country. Graduates, our state and nation is fortunate to be receiving you as their future healthcare providers. Today, it is an honor for me to welcome you as colleagues. Congratulations. And now, will the faculty and graduates please rise for the recessional? Audience, please remain seated until the platform officials, faculty, and graduates have exited the auditorium. And we look forward to interacting with you in the reception in the Stanley Cafe. Thank you and have a great night. <laughs>